Well, many thanks for the for the invite and for giving us a platform to explain a bit our work and the situation of for health and social workers uh, across Europe. I'll, I'll briefly introduce the organization I work for. Uh, the European Federation of Public Services Unions, EPSU, is the European umbrella organization for all workers in the health and social services. So we organize from doctors to cleaning uh, people in, in hospitals, usually cleaning uh, women. Uh, I'll come back to this point because most uh, workers in the health and social services, particularly the lower you get, get in the grades, uh, the more feminine the profession it is, is overwhelming uh, women working in, in the sector and mostly uh, low paid uh, women. That is a, an important fact also to, to see what is uh, what was happened in the last 15 to 20 years and uh, very specifically what happened since the 2008 uh, financial crisis and the austerity measures that were imposed across the board in Europe. I'm going to focus in a couple of examples. In 2016, we did a study, as, as an interesting study that uh, was called She Works Hard for the Money, uh, kind of echoing this, the, the song by Donna Summer, um, which shows that in every single country uh, in Europe, the, the percentage of female to male in the, in the profession, in the health and social services, is, is, is brutal, uh, and particularly to assisting nurses and to the um, supporting staff, and uh, not so much the nurses, but uh, well, everyone else uh, be beyond those that actually are registered nurses and, and GPs. And uh, the lowest uh, percentage, I mean, relation men to female uh, across Europe is 87, for the assistant nurses, is 87.7% and 123 uh, this is 87 uh, female and 12 uh, male that's in italy and it goes goes up uh to to 94 96 uh, 98 uh, percent in, in in many countries and the netherlands is 95 in portugal is 93 uh, in spain is, is 91 so this is a profession that is basically is a, a job that is basically done by women and as I said, the policies of, of the EU, of, of the austerity measures, uh, growth and stability pact, were uh, not directly uh, targeted at the health systems, because the European Union does not have a direct competence over health, but it was a general uh, across the, the board demand of cutting uh, the public budget. And, and therefore, in all countries, the health budget is, is, is very important. So there's been a reduction of health budgets here, there and everywhere. Uh, that has led to privatization, commercialization, marketization of the public uh, healthcare, and usually a mechanism whereby you would do something in a public private partnership and you'll manage to take off the public sector books of the annual uh, budget a part of it, uh, so basically you're giving money to the private, but it doesn't take into account in all the, the, the European rules. And that is how also the, the sector has actually worsened in the conditions because you're breaking down collective agreements and you can actually have first class, second class, third class hospitals, uh, clinics and so on, according to what the type of thing uh, they do. So that has been the case. Uh, the, the most blatant case of, of austerity measure, it's, it's a bit difficult to say, but a, a very blatant one was a recommendation by the IMF, uh, supported by the European Commission, to Latvia that uh, reform its, uh, its health system. And uh, basically the reform amounted to uh, this, well, they disbanded the public health system, so the universal uh, system that you would have in, in Spain or in the UK. Uh, so the, the type of national health system or, or the Spanish social security system. And uh, they introduce a system based on, on mutuality. This uh, was part of the cut that they had to be done because the, the, uh, the bankruptcy that the, the Latvian economy 
and this uh, public sector uh, um, reform meant a wage cut of 26% uh, overnight in Latvia and the abolition of well the system where people would go to the hospital without an insurance. So basically what the public sector became was emergency and rescue only. And that would be for people who did not have access to insurance, as i.e. people who were either unemployed or already retired or working in precarious uh, jobs. So that, that was, the, I mean, the, 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 the fights in Latvia were massive. There was, a t a, at the time, a, a way of speaking and saying in, in Greece, people organized general strikes. In Latvia, uh, workers would buy a, a single ticket, single, uh, uh, like a single ticket with Air Baltic to another country to work abroad. So before the pandemic, this was copied in other countries, such as uh, Italy. There were also cuts uh, in the public health budgets and so on. Uh, probably the most iconic one, of course, is Greece. Greece before the pandemic, <coughs> excuse me, the unions were uh, demanding 5,000 new GPs and 25,000 new nurses due to the lack of renewal of the sector that has had happened in the previous decade. So when the pandemic hit hard in, in Greece, the, in the second wave, the first wave, Greece was relatively uh, untouched. There was an, a massive uh, lack of capacity due to the lack of nurses and GPs. And what has happened since, and it's not the only country, is that many are abandoning the profession because wages were cut uh, in the public sector in Greece were, were cut in a kind of a horizontal between 10 and 15 percent across the board everyone got uh, uh, that wage reduction and uh, and the workloads are uh, extreme and this is the other side of the coin of austerity is that in many countries the wages have not they, they might have stagnated but they might have not uh, received this cut but the workloads have increased because there has been the 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 the, the rate of reposition in the sector is not uh, fulfilled. Uh, so people retire, people go on burnout, people get ill, and uh, they are not replaced uh, in the in the workplaces. That we see very specific in the social services, where there are no nurses and there are less qualified personnel, and. Um, the, the the rhythms, uh, the the number of staff taking care of uh, elderly people in the care homes is is going to one assistant nurse every fifty, every sixty, every seventy people that is in the in the different wards. So this is this is generally the the condition, uh, and and what the pandemic has done is just expose this and and push to to the limits of the possibility of of health worker. Um, at the beginning of September, so between the first and the second wave uh, in Belgium, one in four healthcare and social services workers were either off sick, on burnout, or had dropped from the position. Just twenty-five percent of the total workforce had abandoned the social services because it's all well and good to applaud uh, at eight o'clock when there was uh, the beginning of the pandemic and say they are heroes and so on. But the problem is that the charge has been so heavy uh, in the last 12 months, that it was already very heavy before uh, the global pandemic, that quite a few of them just, they just can't cope uh, with, the, with the level of stress, with the rhythms, and with risking their lives for very little, if you, if you think about it. So that's the situation. We can go country by country and look uh, also, at the level of mobilization, I think is also an important element, is that in the last few years, no, like 20 years, eh, the last three, four years before the pandemic, uh, or before the breakout of the pandemic, we saw uh, strikes of nurses, of assistant nurses, of student nurses, uh, of generally the healthcare personnel, um, almost in every single European country. And the first hospital strike in the history of the Netherlands happened six, mo six months before of the breakout of the pandemic. We had massive mobilization in across Belgium in hospitals of the different uh, mutuality systems. We have had 
strike after strike and mobilization after mobilization in Spain. No, doctors and nurses in Portugal were also mobilizing. There were a big movement uh, in the private uh, healthcare sector in Italy who didn't have a collective agreement. Uh, the last collective agreement they had signed was uh, 14 years ago. Uh, and there was very many things that were not taken into account. Uh, there's been like per lander in Germany mobilization after mobilization to actually get lump sums, uh, particularly for the lower grades for uh, nursing assistants and so on, and so on and so forth. Uh, in Eastern Europe, it's actually the wages in Eastern Europe, uh, health workers have gone up, particularly because there was a drain of people living uh, Slovakia, the Czech Republic, to work to Austria, to work to Germany, because of the such a low level of wages that people would prefer to drive two hours to work in the other side of the border, so there was a real issue, and 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 they, they were not actually in a good position to negotiate higher wages, um, but no more staff. So so it's, it's, it's a strange trade-off. So health workers have been demanding more. They are they need more investment. They need more funding. They need respect. And uh, what the pandemic has done is just basically put push, basically to the to the a bit more against the wall. And that's um, that's what has been in the last uh, 10, 15 years is I've basically been following uh, this dossier and, uh, and well, as an organization, we've been denouncing, coordinating and supporting uh, trade union organizations and, and citizen movements that have been uh, demanding a change of, part of a paradigm for for the health system. We see as you know, federation at the European level has these three roles, exchange of info, uh, exchange of best practices, if you want, and also where does it work and how does it work, uh, and also have a propositive uh, and try to, well, be the fora of discussion of organizations that are saying no to this, um, and also link up with other platforms. I mean, for that, EPSU, we've historically worked with a lot of associations that are not at trade unions, uh, and we believe that public sector trade unions need to think also in the ethos of the public sector, which is the broader citizenship. Huh? Well, the health sector is like patients and the families and, you know, uh, but at the end of the day, that means the bulk, the bulk I mean, the, the 95% of society. Um, so we represent a, percent, a percentage, but we work with the rest. Huh? That if you take health and uh, the provision of water, the provision of electricity, and the, the services the municipality, the regions and the governments give, you know, it, basically give services uh, or our members work giving services to society. So in that societal coalition, we believe that the unions have the specificity of workers working in the sector, but also need to reach out to consumer organizations, patient groups, um, you know, um, think tanks that have a progressive view, study centers and watchdogs uh, to look the fight against corruption and so on and so forth. So that's a bit our role, try to build bridges, try to promote our vision, try to support and encourage those that need support and encourage at local level. Uh, and and, and well, all those three things uh, with the resources that we have.